talking today about spiritual warfare and specifically about guarding our peace. Huh. You know, in the Old Testament, we read that there was a tribe of Issachar. And the tribe of Issachar was known to be the tribe who understood the times and the seasons that they were in. They understood the times and the seasons that they were in. And I felt in my spirit, I've been feeling in my spirit that as we have declared at the start of the year that each one reach one, it is an aggressive and bold statement against the forces of the enemy. It is an offensive statement to the forces of darkness. The moment we declared at the start of the year that it is a harvest season, each one reach one, guess what? You have not just been enlisted as an evangelist on your own uh, 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 as you are, but you have been enlisted in the army of God. That the enemy does not like it when the, when the kingdom of God advances. And there is active opposition right now, and I want to release this prophetically, that we are in the middle of war. Each one, reach one, is just not a nice statement for the year. This is a bold statement that actually declares war against the forces of the enemy that, has, that have taken captive the loved ones in our lives, our families, our bodies, our minds, our situations, our work. I want you to know that the moment we declare that we are advancing, whatever happens, the enemy, the camp of the enemy, immediately gather forces to oppose what God wants to do. We are in the middle of war, and the war has been won. But let me tell you something, church. When I was in university, because I majored in German, we had to learn German history in German. And so um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the most significant lessons of German history that I found out was that at the end, when the Allied forces won World War II, that in the concentration camps, when the Allied forces already won the victory of World War II, there were still Nazi soldiers that kept the prisoners captive. Because the prisoners did not know that the war, was, that the war had ended. The prisoners did not know that the Allied forces had already won the war. They did not know they were in prison. They, there was no social media. They didn't have Twitter, Snapchat. There was no hashtag World War ended. There was no hashtag we won Allied forces. You know, there was no trending on social media. Nobody in the, in the concentration camps, camps knew that the war had already ended. And because these generals, these little colonels, these little whatever their, their titles were, these soldiers knew that they were already defeated, but because their prisoners did not know that, they still treated them. Some camps treated the prisoners still as prisoners for the next two years after the war had already ended. And so, yes, the victory has been won on the cross. But there are so many people out there, and some of us here still don't know that the victory has been won on the cross. And that is where the war is at. Because although the cross has disarmed the principalities, rulers, and spiritual forces that oppose the will of God, the enemy works through deception and ignorance. He blinds us, just like the Nazi soldiers kept the prisoners in prison, not knowing anything that the war has been won. So it is not about whether we'll win the war or not. The war has already been won. But whether we know it or not, and whether we live like it or not, is a question. And that is where the enemy fights against us. Is, are we living out the victory that Jesus has won on the cross? 1 Peter 5, 7 to 8. Peter warns us. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert. Right after that, he says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, look at the person beside you, say, you have an enemy, and it's not me. <laughs> I might look like your enemy, but I'm not your enemy. <laughs> 
Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. First of all, if you, how many of you enjoy watching Nat Geo? Animal Planet, sorry, National Geographic. <laughs> Millennial. <laughs> National Geographic or Animal Planet. So when you watch those shows where the lion is hunting for, his, for its prey, they don't, they don't stroll around in front of their prey. They prowl around, they hide among tall weeds and tall grasses, and they, they're almost unseen. And what they do is they do it by shock. I, you know, that's the most scientific term I can, I can use. They do it by sh with a shock factor where they would just like pounce on their prey. But in the, before that, they were just like prowling, can't be seen, camouflage. That's the picture that Peter was pointing out here. Cast all your anxiety on him and followed by that. And that is followed by be, be sober and vigilant. Let me, let me go back there. Cast all your anxiety on him, all your worries, all your fears. Cast it on him because he cares for you. And that, all those fears and anxieties are going to stop you from being sober and vigilant. So cast, you cannot be sober, you cannot be vigilant if you're full of anxiety and worries and fear. That's what Peter is saying here. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Do not entertain your worries, do not entertain your fears, because the moment you do that, you will not be able to be sober and be vigilant and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Ephesians 6, 11 to 12, Paul tells the Ephesian, Ephesian church, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We are at war. Years ago, when I was pregnant with Sam, uh, Pastor Jerome Ocampo, he moves in the prophetic um, in the Philippines, and, and he prayed over Pastor Knapp and I while I was pregnant with Sam, and he laid hands on, on, my, on, my, on me and said, you know, um, the Lord's hand is upon this child, and he said, watch be careful to watch his life because many times God will use his life as a message to the church. And I had been thinking about this spiritual warfare thing like for how many weeks now that there is, there is something going on in the spirit. And, and I've just been really, really been in, been in more intense in my intercession than I usually am. And this week, Sam had a dream. And Sam, I, I listen to Sam's dream because there have been many times God uses his dreams to speak to us about the church. When we were in the Philippines, he had a dream about Satan coming into the, coming into the church and coming into this huge house stealing kids. And it was actually at the start of our fight against children from um, being, um, being kidnapped for sex trafficking. And he didn't know that. And he had that dream. And so, so there have been several times, too, that he would have a dream. And, and we felt like the Lord was speaking to him, uh, speaking to us through his dream. And this week, Sam had a dream. He said, Mommy, I woke up. It was so weird because in my dream, I was in the present. But then I saw this vision. And in my vision, I saw a huge demonic archangel that tried to go after me. And I knew, and then I saw how the, this demonic angel trapped me. And so when the vision ended in my dream, he was still in his dream, he said, I, the vision ended my dream, and I said to my friend, um, let's not go there, let's not do this, because that's how the enemy is going to trap us. And in his dream, this archangel literally hunted them down, he said. 
And he said, we ran and we ran and we ran and I remember everything I saw in the vision and, and I said, okay, I can't go that way because that's how the enemy's gonna trap me and all that stuff. And he said, and then I went into this room where I hid under stacks of hats and sweaters and the, this archangel tried to enter the room and he couldn't see me. And I knew that there was a significance in the dream. First of all, I knew that this was about the Lord is going to show the church the enemy's strategy before it even takes place. Just like God told Elisha the plans of the Aramean king, and the Aramean king would make plots about, okay, we're going to ambush the Israelites here, and God would hear their plot and tell Elisha that that's what the Aramean king is going to be doing. And so Elisha would tell the king, and they would mobilize the Israelite army to meet the, the enemy. And so every time the Aramean king had to strategize, the Lord would reveal to Elisha the strategy of the enemy. And I felt in my spirit that we are in the season where God is going to speak to you and give you discernment of what the enemy is trying to do before he even tries to do it. And that God is going to give us a strategy as to how to address it when it happens. Before it happens. Hallelujah. We are at war, but God is victorious. And so how does the enemy attack us if Jesus has already disarmed the principalities? He attacks us only through one, through two methods, deception and lies. That's deception and lies. Deception, including ignorance and lies. Because the only weapon that the enemy has against the people of God is through deception and lies. The main battlefield is our minds. Because this is, this is what receives deception and lies. This, our, our senses, our perception, it are the portals to possible deception and lies. And so 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5, Paul tells us, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our weapons of warfare are not worldly. They're not... PhDs or, or uh, having the greatest, that, that, that's not necessarily the weapons of our we weapons of warfare are mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. And these strongholds exist in our souls and in our minds. These strongholds exist in our thought life. Listen, the first thing that the enemy wants to, to steal from us, you know that Jesus said, the, the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy and jesus says but i have come to give you life and life more abundantly in first john chapter 4 john also tells us that jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy so jesus giving us life and life more abundantly is destroying the works of the enemy are you are you are you hearing me church so Jesus healing sickness is destroying the works of the enemy. Jesus releasing provision is destroying the work of poverty. Jesus releasing uh, 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 peace is destroying the work of fear in our lives. Everything that Jesus does destroys the work of the enemy. In the same way, all of us have strongholds. Whether it's a stronghold of the enemy or a stronghold of God, we have strongholds. Jesus tells his disciples, there was a wise builder and there was a foolish builder. The wise man built his house upon a rock. It became so strong that no matter the winds, no matter the storm, that house never tumbled down. That's a stronghold. So every time we obey God, we're building God's stronghold in our lives. And every time we disobey, we're building a different stronghold. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God through the pulling down of strongholds. First of all, you and I cannot build the stronghold of God without peace. 
And that is my focus this morning, is that in this war, the first thing the enemy attempts to destroy, kill, or steal is our peace. The word peace is so, has been so overused that oftentimes we lose the complete meaning of the word peace, which in Hebrew is shalom. Shalom. So it's not just world peace. It's not just a Miss Universe answer. It's not just peace be with you. Peace be with you. <laughs> it's not just, it's not, we've, we've used it so many times, we've lost, do you know that peace is a very powerful word? The word shalom actually means wholeness, a sense of completeness. Shalom in Hebrew is often used to refer to a state of well-being where there is tranquility, prosperity, and the circumstances around one's life are unblemished by any defect or fault, meaning to say completely perfect, unbroken, whole, complete, more than sufficient, abundant. Shalom is a picture of the Garden of Eden before sin came in. Shalom is both in Hebrew used not just politically uh, in, in, in a sense that describing of a, describing of a country without war, but it is also used socially, relationally, meaning you and I have shalom because our relationship is perfectly whole and complete. There is nothing broken between us, nothing broken between me and God, nothing broken in my body system, nothing wrong, nothing blemished, shalom. When Adam and Eve, before they fell into sin, when Adam and Eve were together walking in the garden in the cool of the day with God, there was complete shalom. There was nothing to be hidden. There was nothing to be ashamed of. There was no, no lack. They had everything they need to prosper. They had everything they needed to prosper. God gave them all the fruit-bearing trees. All they needed to do was be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. And so they would, be, they would have been able to be fruitful, multiply, and subdue because of that shalom. What stops us from fruitfulness and from subduing and taking dominion is when shalom is absent. Shalom enabled and empowered Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. God will never give us a command what he will not empower us to fulfill. And so when he says, Go, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, he said that in the context of completeness and abundance. You have no lack you will not face any lack. You have nothing. You need nothing else. You have everything you need to be fruitful, to multiply, and subdue the earth. That is, but when they fell, when they disobeyed God, when they fell into the deception of the enemy, then shalom was broken. They began to see each other in a broken way. Shame entered in. They began to see God in a distorted way. They started hiding from God. There was no more shalom. And the curse entered in and all of that. Fast forward, Jesus, who Paul says is the second Adam, Jesus completely obeyed the Father even unto death on the cross. And what he did on the cross was not just to forgive our sins. What he did was, a, he was basically, the cross is like D-Day. How many of you are familiar with D-Day on the shores of Normandy? The determining day for World War II, the turning point of World War II, what Jesus did on the cross was like D-Day. It was the, determin the turning point of human history, the turning point of man's history with God. On the cross, it was, the cross was not just a sad picture of our sin met with justice, but it was also a military act. You know that when a, when the soldiers, and I, I really hesitate to talk about this because I know Pastor Jerry's from PMA, and <laughs> but, but I love studying um, um, war history. And 
And when the soldiers would, would overtake a place that's been occupied by the enemy, and when they've defeated that, the, the, the enemies in that certain area, that they would, they would stake their flag, correct? They would stake their flag on the ground to say, we've taken this territory, correct? The cross is heaven staking the flag of the Father's love on earth, saying, earth has been taken back. It was a military act. It was, he disarmed the principalities at the cross. This is it. And he is called Prince of Peace. What was he doing when he reconciled all things? Paul says God was in him reconciling all things to the Father. Reconciling us to the Father and all things. What was he doing? He was aligning. To reconcile means aligning. He was aligning all things back to the Father's original design and intent. The word reconcil reconciliation is a picture of shalom restored. Because when you fix something broken so that that which is broken becomes whole, shalom is restored. And so he is the prince of peace. In Isaiah, Isaiah called him the prince of peace, wonderful cancer, everlasting father, prince of peace. And Isaiah even associates Christ's kingdom with peace. As in Isaiah 9, 7, he says, And of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. Of the increase of Christ's kingdom and of his peace, there will be no end. Meaning to say, Jesus did not just come to, to establish his kingdom, but along with his kingdom, he established shalom back. That is why Paul tells the church, Paul the Apostle tells the church, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. What was Jesus doing on the cross? He restored shalom, the sense of being complete, lacking nothing, the sense of having the abundance we need so that we can be who God called us to be and do what God has called us to do. And so this whole shalom is a very powerful word. And this is what the enemy is after. He knows that if he can steal your peace, you won't be able to move forward. The will of God is that his government will always be increasing. Right? Isaiah 9, 7, And of the increase of his government of peace, there shall be no end. So the will of God, upon when we receive our Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it does not stop there. The goal, the will of God is that his kingdom would continue to increase in us in proportion to the peace and of his government and of his peace. His government goes together with shalom. His kingdom goes together with shalom. And so whenever he increases in our lives, he also increases shalom. When his rule is increased, shalom is increased. Or it can be vice versa. When shalom is increased, his dominion in us is increased. And so whenever the enemy tries to steal from us shalom, he's trying to steal the work of God's kingdom in us. Are you following? So Satan does not want us to step into shalom. He is actively resisting for us. He will throw all the fiery darts of the enemy so that, listen, if you read, when you have time, read Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God. One of the weapons that we have are the sandals of peace. The sandals of peace, of shalom. Because shalom is what gets you to move forward. Shalom is what gets you to take your step forward. The enemy is after your peace. Look at the person beside you. The enemy is after your peace. Watch it. I'm not trying to magnify the enemy. I'm trying, uh, I'm trying to get us to be aware Paul says that we will not be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. 
So how do we wage war to guard our peace? How do we wage war to guard our peace? Number one, fill your mind with the word of God. Fill your mind with the word of God. The only offensive weapon we have is the sword of the Spirit. This is powerful. This is, this is atomic bomb. <laughs> the Word of God is not just... John We're not just into memory verses. This is every time we use the Word of God, we are shooting missiles into the enemy's camp. We are breaking down the works of the enemy. How did Jesus overcome Satan's temptation? By using... The Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is able to penetrate and, 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 and expose that which is of the flesh and that which is of the spirit. The Word of God exposes us, exposes our hearts. I was talking to Pastor Knapp about, about you know, how... Um, when we were in the youth ministry a long time ago, not so long time ago, did I just say that? Not so long time ago, when we were in the youth ministry and we were trained for spiritual warfare and it became, we were so new to it that we became paranoid. And that is not the goal of this message. We don't want you guys to be paranoid like we were. Where everywhere we went, we just saw what the enemy was doing. Because the gift of discernment is not just to discern what the enemy is doing, but to discern what God is doing. So that you can declare what God is doing and overcome what the enemy is doing. And so when we were younger, younger, we were so paranoid about spiritual warfare, and it was all about, I bind, I bind, I bind, in Jesus' name, bind, in Jesus' name, everything, bind. <laughs> we bound everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I remember as a young person, I would have all these thoughts. So I would have all these self-pity thoughts. Self-pity had a stronghold in my life for many years, for many years. And I never knew it was a stronghold, and I never even knew it was an opposer of, of God's will and purpose in my life. For me, self-pity was a place of comfort. Because of what happened to me when I was a kid, when I, w when I got molested repeatedly, self-pity self became my place of comfort. That feeling like a victim became my place of comfort. But I never knew that. I just kept binding it. And I just kept binding and binding and binding the spirit of self-pity, and it would never go away. And, and the Lord was, what the Lord was teaching me is so many times, the thoughts that repeatedly come to us, that never, that have a hard time going away, the thoughts that we always battle, if it's the same thoughts that, all, that we always battle with, there is a root to that, and that's called a stronghold. And the root to that is either a wound, an offense, unforgiveness, whether it's towards others or towards ourselves. And so rejection. Uh, so there is a lot of layers to that, and I did not know that until I devoured the Word of God. Because the Word of God exposes, exposes the deepest things in our hearts. And so church, the first thing that we need to do is to wrap our minds with the Word of God. Knowing the Word of God enables us to identify the lies of the enemy. When my dad was working for the bank years ago, he said that the first training they, they had to go through was determining which bills were fake and which ones were not. And the way they were trained to determine which ones are fake was to touch the original ones so many times in a day, not the fake. They had to keep touching the original bills so many times in a day so that the moment they touched the fake ones, they immediately knew it was fake. So you don't study the lies of the enemy to expose the lies of the enemy. You study the truth and you will be set free from the lies of the enemy. The truth will expose the lies. 
The truth exposes the lies. Fill our minds with the word of God. Remember, the moment your peace, you're, the moment you are shaken, the enemy is trying to steal your peace. And you must be on your guard against that moment. The moment you feel that, you go back to the word of God. You say, Lord, what do you have to say about this? I am not feeling right right now. How many times have you experienced that? How many of you have experienced that? Where you go to work, you've, done, you've prayed that morning, and you go to work, and you just feel restless. Lord, what are you trying to say? What, show me, give me a word. Give me a passage, Jesus. Aligning our thoughts to the Word of God can only be possible if we know the Word of God. We cannot align to something we don't know. Knowing the Word of God enables us to discern the arguments and high things that exalt against God. So number one is fill your mind with the Word of God. Not just verse of the day. Verse of the day is powerful, right? But I encourage you to dig deeper than that. You know, so, so, so whenever, you know, anyway, I'm getting into details. Don't just get, devour the word of God. The word of God causes what is dead in us to come alive. The word of God causes the, the impure motives in us to come to the surface. When thoughts of suspicions come to your mind about a certain person, don't just say, I, I discern something. Get in the Word and say, Lord, examine my heart and see if there is anything offensive before you. Why I'm suspicious about this person. Do I hold an offense against this person? Are you, yes, the Word of God. Say, fill my mind with the Word of God. Fill my mind with the word of God. It is the most exciting thing that we can do as a people of God. Number two, address the thoughts that the enemy is throwing at you. Don't just ignore them, but don't also entertain them. See, Eve, when the serpent started talking to Eve, prior to that situation, God gave them a command. Till the garden and make it fruitful. Keep the garden and make it fruitful. Meaning to say they were the gatekeepers of the garden. Keep the garden. They were the gatekeepers of the garden. And the fact that the serpent was talking to her something that was not in line with, the, with what God had told her to, what God had told them about that tree, Eve should have immediately shut down the serpent. He, she should not have, uh-huh, uh-huh, ooh, ah, oh. and stared at the fruit, huh, oh. hmm. She, did she immediately do it? No, it starts with entertaining. Well, what if when you get to work, you are part of the ones that are getting laid off? Well, what if, what about when, so when you get laid off and there are no job opportunities around you, and then your thoughts... Far. Now I got to move to Saskatchewan. Now I got to move to, you know, so you, your thoughts run so far. How many of you can relate? Your thoughts run quickly far. It just starts with, oh, somebody told me yesterday that some of us are going to get laid off. Okay. And then that thought whoo, branches out. Ooh, what if it's me? Oh no, what if nobody accepts me because I'm already 50? Oh no, I'm already, and do you get what I'm saying? And the thoughts go so far. Right at that moment, that already, what if it's me? The moment you say, what if I get laid off? You immediately go to the word of God saying, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. When I got my new job in the organization I'm in right now, it was a huge, we were negative <laughs> in, our, in, our, in, our, in our financials. It was really a huge, I was like, why did I get this job again? And, 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 but I knew that God's hand was on this work. 
because we were ministering to a lot of at-risk moms. We were, we were ministering to a lot of women that wanted to keep their babies, but they were either in substance abuse or they were either recovering from it and they, they, they needed help. And there, some, some women wanted to keep their babies, but they just are suffering for a lot of trauma from sex trafficking. They, we were serving. This is the work of God. And so every day I would be like, panicking lord where's the money gonna come from where's the money gonna and i'm just like lord this is your work and i just kept declaring and declaring and declaring that we we i come against the spirit of poverty because this work is from the work of god and and so i just kept declaring the word of god and at the end of the year we saw a 68 percent increase in revenue and it has nothing to do with me it has something to do with us standing on the word of god that if god commanded this work he will provide for it and so these thoughts the peace without peace you cannot fight and so you must guard your peace with declaring the word of god address the thoughts don't just ignore it address it if you hear in your mind oh your husband is so useless that does not happen in this church. <laughs> All the husbands should say amen. <laughs> when you hear in your mind while you're driving to work because you just woke up and, and your mind is like, oh, your husband's so useless, did not wash the dishes last night. And, 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 and I, I'm just, I'm not talking about anyone here, okay? I'm not even talking about Pastor Nap. <laughs> I'm not talking about anyone, but just as an example, okay? Just as an example. So husbands, don't think that your wife was talking to me before the service. <laughs> so if you have these thoughts, oh, my husband is so useless and all of that, don't just ignore it by being silent. You address it. You say, I thank you, Lord, for my husband. I honor my husband. I thank you. He is a man of God, that his heart belongs to Jesus, and you are working in his life, that what the enemy is doing in him, you're going to turn it around and work, cause it to work out for his good. And all the husbands say amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't just ignore it. Don't just keep it to yourself. Don't just be mum about it. Address your thoughts. Don't just say, I bind that spirit in Jesus' name. You address it. If, you, if, if you're struggling financially, I want you to address those thoughts. Father, I pray that if my finances are not aligned to your word, that if the way I'm stewarding my finances are not aligned to your word, I give you permission to correct me. I give you permission to address it in my life, and I give your word permission to change the way I'm managing my finances. You address it. You, when you're in lack, don't just say, oh, provision in Jesus' name. Don't just say, I call it forth from the east, from the north, from the south, from the west. And you're not walking in line with the word of God. You got to address it. Sometimes we ask for peace. So Jesus says to his disciples, peace I give you, peace I leave with you, but not as the world gives. Because the world's peace is a band-aid. Jesus' peace deals with our deep issues. Sometimes we don't have peace because there are certain issues in our lives that need to be addressed. Amen? And so do not, I'm almost done. There is no magic verse. Don't come up with, okay, if I'm in lack, this is my verse. And my God shall provide all my need according to his riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's no magic verse, but you need to get in the verse. You need to get in the word and address it and be led by the spirit of God. Lastly, number three, stay covered. I found it very interesting that in Sam's dream, he said that the enemy could not see him because he was hidden under a stack of hats. And sweaters and I took that as that is a powerful truth in the church today that covering covering is very powerful and important in our spiritual warfare 
Stay covered. Look at the person beside you. Say, stay covered. Don't be a Rambo. For all you millennials out there, Rambo is actually, Google it. <laughs> You'll find Rambo in Britannica.com. <laughs> None of us is called to fight alone. Stay covered. Be accountable. Hats represent people in authority, people of different roles over you. Sweaters covered. Stay covered. When you're in the middle of a struggle, when you're in the middle of a storm, the last thing you need is to isolate, the last thing you should do is to isolate yourself and say nobody understands what I'm going through. What you need is to go and seek covering. Hey, cover me. Cover me in prayer. I am really going through this. Cover me in prayer. I can tell, I know that a lot of us here have, have, have overcome a lot of challenges because somebody prayed for us while we were in the middle of a storm. Amen. Stay covered. Stay under covering. There is protection when we stay accountable, when we stay covered. There is protection. If you've watched... Um, a lot of these war films, how many of you have seen Black Hawk Down? It's an old war film <laughs> in the 90s. And, 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 and because that was my first lesson to the importance of covering, that I did not know that cover me is actually a military term. And that when you, whenever the soldiers had to move forward or advance to another area that they wanted to go to, that they would tell their comrades, cover me, and then... That way, they could run without getting hit by a bullet because somebody's covering them, firing at the enemy. And so they could go to where they needed to go. And so in warfare, whenever you are struggling and the enemy is trying to steal your peace, get on your phone. Now, you don't need to get on Facebook and put it on your post, okay? You get, but you get on to the prayer warriors in this house. You get on to your life group leaders. You get on to your pastors. You get on and say, I need covering right now. Cover me. Guard your peace. When somebody tells you, I got diagnosed with with stage whatever cancer, I want you to understand that we need to change the way we talk. And I'm not saying, oh, no, that's not true. I'm not talking about denial. I'm saying understanding that nothing, no situation, no doctor's report, no stage whatever cancer diminishes the power of the cross. Nothing, no valley that we go through diminishes the power of the cross. That's why the psalmist says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow and death, I will fear no evil because there is no amount of evil that can diminish it, that can diminish the power of Jesus' work on the cross. The wounds on his back, the stripes on his back are still as powerful. It does not diminish as the year passes by. It does not diminish based on the mountain you're facing. It does not diminish based on the darkness you're going through. It does not even diminish no matter how many times we fall. The righteous fall seven times but gets back up again. Why? Why are we able to get back up again? Because no matter how many times we fall, God's power to raise us back up still remains the same. Our weaknesses may feel weaker, our strength may feel little, but His strength is always perfect. His grace is always sufficient. It does not diminish no matter how many rounds in the arena you're in. Ha! I get so mad when the enemy mocks me. Sorry, I'm just a fighter. You, Pastor Knapp can tell you. <laughs> but I get so mad when the enemy mocks me about what Jesus has done on the cross. 
There is nothing too difficult, too big for Jesus. And so I'm going to end with this because we're going to call and we're going to believe for shalom to be restored to a lot of people today. We're going to be calling for shalom to be restored to the sick, shalom to be restored to those who are in lack, shalom to be restored to those who are trapped in fear and worries. I'm going to end with this. And uh, in, our, in our anniversary celebration last year, and Pastor Jerry, and a lot of you were there, and we had that man stand up and give his testimony because the doctors had given up on him. Doctors had given up on him, and he was a family friend of Pastor Knapp's family from Stratford, and the doctors had already told him to get his life in order, get his everything in order because there's no more hope. His heart was failing every day. His kidneys had shut down. He had to go through dialysis every every so often in a week and basically the doctors just said it's just a matter of waiting but he had this little faith and he said i know i'm not done yet and the reports kept getting worse every month the reports kept getting worse until finally pastor nap email texted him and said Kuya, I woke up this morning with Psalm 16 as a word for you specifically. And in Psalm 16, it says, you will not allow your anointed one to go down in show and, and something to do about you. Not, you will not allow your anointed one to, to decay and go down in show, sheol or show. And, and it, it speaks of death. You will not allow him to go to death. And he grabbed a hold of that word. And he said, yes, Lord, it's not my time. And make the long story short, today, he does not even have a respirator anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He, his kidneys started working again. His heart got stronger again. He was at his last final days according to the doctor. But how many of you know that the word of God is higher and more superior than any medical diagnosis, than any doctor's report? It did not... It doesn't mean that we deny it. It means that we acknowledge it, but we take this higher than what we've heard. It doesn't matter how long you got to battle, but you have something to battle with. And every time you get up and you hold your sword in the spirit, that that power keeps breaking down that wall that, that tries to oppose the will of God. Do not stop. I borrow Churchill's words, never, 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 never. Do not let the enemy rob you of your peace. Because the moment you lose your peace, you will quit. 